Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming this morning. Um, so, so I'm going to sort of like quickly have our sort of like morning sessions sort of panelists sort of come up on the stage uh, into Guerrero, Cosmin Costinas, um, Michelle Quay, and Grace Sambo. Uh, we're going to sort of like uh, divide today's sort of like symposium into two halves. The morning session will be a panel discussion, and in the afternoon, we'll sort of like do the individual sort of public presentation. And uh, our speakers uh, also sort of like invited guest tutors who have spent the past five days um, sharing some of the ideas um, uh, with participants of the workshop that we've run in conjunction with this public symposium. And it's really to sort of like discover, you know, the potential of sort of like storytelling and to sort of like think alongside the participants, um, different kinds of like projects they're invested in and uh, how we've um, tried to sort of like design this program. And this is the first time we've been doing it. It's really to sort of like think of a way to sort of like think about this bigger sort of like question about how we sort of like tell compelling stories, not through a sort of like prescriptive lens, but maybe something that uh, uses sort of like maybe uh, sharing of sort of like ideas, inspirations and methods to sort of uh, possibly explore uh, uh, other possibilities and other sort of like options in which participants can, can sort of like take home and use and to, to sort of like uh, improve and maybe uh, hopefully, um, tell that interesting story that they want to tell through their various sort of like projects, and many of them come from very many multi, uh, disciplinary sort of like backgrounds. Uh, but what I liked, uh, but what I think I find was most rewarding during the week is how sort of like engaged everyone was um, with each other, and as much as there's all these sort of like kinks along the way in trying to sort of, uh, you know, figure out what we're here to sort of like do together, right? Uh, I think there was, um, at the end of the day, some uh, very interesting sort of like uh, things that have sort of like emerged. And I feel like the kind of like relationship that have sort of like emerged out of this workshop would hopefully be a long lasting one and will sort of like continue to sort of, uh, you know, have a lot of resonances in how uh, others and cultural workers are able to sort of collaborate with each other like uh, five to ten years down the line. Okay, great. So without further ado, we're going to sort of like start with um, this morning's sort of like discussion. Do I have a chat for me? Is there a chat for me? So, okay. Okay. so how are we going to sort of like do this this morning is I'm going to get each of our panelists to um, in some ways uh, uh, provide a five minute sort of like statement uh, position, I guess. And after that, I guess using this sort of like statement position, we're going to start to have a conversation around this idea of learning through exhibitions and collections. I think there's a lot of value in uh, staging sort of like exhibitions, as well as, you know, uh, maintaining archive, as well as keeping sort of like a collection of sort of like information on things that uh, some can call art, others can call sort of like documents or or other sort of like uh, things that one sort of like store or is a custodian sort of like off, right? So learning from uh, these things called collections and exhibitions uh, uh, can be very sort of like generative. And we have uh, Michelle Kwe, who is a, a music, uh, education officer at the uh, US Museum in Singapore. Uh, Grace sort of like runs a research initiative called Hyphen in Yogyakarta. Inti Guerrero uh, is uh, the director of Abelas Artes in the Philippines and an adjunct curator of, of Latin American art at the Tate Lon London. Uh, and Cosmin uh, Costinas is uh, the director and curator of um, Parasite, a very sort of like important sort of like art space in Hong Kong. Yep. So um, who wants to sort of like go first? I know Grace has expressed interest to go last. So she has booked the spot. Um, so any sort of like maybe volunteer? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'll go first. Okay. I'll find All the right. spot. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. So my name is Michelle, and I'm from the National University of Singapore Museum, or the NUS Museum, just simply. So I'm manager of the outreach team where we conceive and execute programs uh, with, and my personal focus is on education and student development. Oh, oh there's many things to hold. Okay, Ken, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so Simon asked us to choose three images, um, but I couldn't do it, but I have three slides, so I hope that's okay. So I want to start with, okay, 
I want to start with this image. Um, this is a woodblock print by a Singaporean artist Lim Mu Hui um, called Backstage of a Puppet Theatre that's in our museum's collection. Not to be too dramatic, but this work actually changed my life because I first encountered this 10 years ago um, in 2009 when I was a third year student in NUS. And I was taking a history module about popular culture in Singapore. And when it came time to do the final essay for this module, I looked at the list and I was like, oh, why is there a question about visual art in this history module? So that intrigued me, and I decided to tackle that question. Um, so with no background in art or visual studies or anything like that, I started to go to the museum to look at this artwork, spend days and hours looking at it. Um, and there were very little written sources to obviously write about an artwork like that, that was made in the 50s. And with woodblock print not being a very popular medium um, in Singapore after the 50s and 60s. So, um, eventually I will come to write that 2000 work that was required, but it was one of the most challenging exercises I ever had to do in my life, uh, at least in university, not life. Um, but it was also the most rewarding because it opened me to the world of arts, uh, the world of museums, and there's infinite possibilities in seeing the world. And it also gave me my job because I found the museum's internship program when researching about this artwork in the museum's collection. So more importantly, um, it also drives me today to try to duplicate the experience that I had with students, um, the stu experience I had with myself with students today through the various avenues that the museum uh, provides. So next, please. Okay, so this is the prep room uh, at the museum. Doesn't look like a gallery, a typical gallery, because it is not. So this past week at the workshop for a country of outliers, I've been sharing about the prep room at the museum. So briefly for everybody, the prep room is a space that facilitates ex exploration of a new project that may or may not become an exhibition. As a public gallery, it also simultaneously invites our visitors to observe and engage in our exhibition making process and throughout the lifespan of the prep room, it is envisioned to evolve with the accumulation of new voices such as uh, from curators, from students, from interns, from academics across the university, um, accumulation of archival materials, curatorial and design experiments. So this is a recent prep room uh, by the artist Fairu Dama called After Ballads in the second floor of the museum. And I've been sharing a lot about this prep room with our participants. Um, but one thing that I haven't shared really with them is, and that I've been keeping for this symposium because we are talking about learning through exhibitions and collections, is how the prep room is a space um, that tolerates and encourages experimentation in our student interns when we invite them to work with us in this space. So for a space that um, prizes experimentation, this is a space where they can work without feeling failure or knowledge. So not surprisingly, the prep room, more than any other space in the museum, is also a space where our students' interns' contribution and potentials are most keenly felt by the public. So let me give you a quick example. Next slide. Thank you, Grace. Okay, so this image is here. This is again with After Ballads with Fairu Dharma. We have two interns, Sarah Lau and Harish Redswan, who has been working with Fairu with his research and experiments in the space. So they worked with him for about at the beginning, three months, but they extended into over a year as they kept coming back to work with him. And from just being assistants, they are also now his full-fledged collaborators that work with him and still talk to him to this day. So Sarah and Harif, as part of their work in the prep room, will actually conceptualize, produce, and direct a video interview with Fairu documenting the project. If you're interested to watch that video, um, it's the QR code link over there. So this video was uh, with minimal supervision from our curator, uh, Sid Perez, who I'm sure some of you are very familiar with. Um, the video was released publicly on the museum's Facebook, and it now serves as both documentation and publicity for the prep room. Um, that also draws in more audiences who may have seen the project or are seeing it at a certain t um, position in time. So it will also kickstart video interviews as a productive manner of working for the museum to document our projects. And Sarah and Harif would actually go on to produce uh, several more videos for other prep rooms in the museum because we saw their capabilities and we wanted to develop them and grow them to do more. So the prep room may be a site in which our audiences view the development of projects, but for our student interns, I think that the most important development is not only just them learning about content, working with artists, you know, getting skills in exhibition uh, and curatorial management, but also learning about themselves and what they are capable with. 
So during this process, um, I knew that they had a lot of problems at the beginning, but at the end, they produced a wonderful video that we use and I continue to share internationally now, and I can tell them um, to this day. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Inti Guerrero, and as Simon was saying, I'm working as artistic director of a nonprofit called Be Bellas Artist Project that has two spaces, um, one a residency program in Bataan and uh, outpost exhibition space in a public library uh, in Manila, in Makati, for people who uh, visit uh, the Philippines in Manila. Uh, you might recognize the area of um, where we're located, and I encourage us to visit us. I, I perhaps it's important uh, also to say that I started working a year ago. Uh, I'm from Bogota, Colombia, from South America, and um, have been um, basically in the region, you could say, since eight years ago, uh, working primarily from Hong Kong. And uh, yes, incorporating Southeast Asian art and artists and uh, personal research uh, towards exhibition projects happening in Hong Kong and in different places. But this is uh, now a year that I've started working in this uh, institution and uh, it's a little bit in the process of making what I'm trying to uh, put together, and uh, as a statement, I guess I wanted to um, give a little glimpse and share with you what I consider could be a statement within the institution, which is uh, this exhibition that just currently came down, um, because it's a five-minute uh, presentation. I'll just... Uh, guide you through some images. So maybe we can go through the next one, which is here. Sorry. Oops. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, I guess as many of you in the room, and I know Simon here to my left, is also obsessed with uh, archives. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of memorabilia and visual material culture in the Philippines for those who have researched um, art and uh, visual culture uh, in the Philippines, you would see that there's a genre of uh, collecting uh, which is called Filipiniana, uh, which is, uh, well, it's a broader cultural term, but in terms of uh, material culture, it's everything that is related to Filipino culture. Uh, that has been produced as image or text uh, in a very massive uh, form of circulation. And uh, there are many, many, many collectors of different periods of the Spanish or American period um, that uh, would fight themselves in auctions, or you can see all types of Facebook groups online that uh, share uh, people's, oops, something's wrong with the, connection. Um, and one of the, there are different, let's say, uh, categories of collecting, and one of these items of collection uh, is a um, vintage photograph, as many other uh, archives, but within this specific uh, large uh, universe of vintage photograph, you could tell by visiting uh, private uh, collections that there is a specific interest on collecting um, photographs of the queens of carnival, which are beauty queens that took, beauty pageants that took place between 1908 and 1936 that were um, created and stimulated by the American uh, government as a larger endeavor of creating a carnival for investment and industry and commerce at that time. Basically, the government at that time would, 
have every province uh, and every city, in some cases, be represented in this carnival with a pavilion uh, showing its goods and creating its PR for uh, building up basically a very early stage capitalism. And every pavilion and every state would then have its own um, beauty queen representing uh, the territory. So again, it's this uh, larger conversation about uh, the female body in relation to territorial representation. And this is just a one very single photograph of um, one of the many uh, beauty pageants. And throughout the decades, the 1910s, the 1920s, the 1930s, you can tell that there's a different change of style and of taste and of idiom and of representations of beauty. And, and what uh, we wanted to make uh, within the exhibition is to highlight that this specific moment of Queens of Carnival was somehow the archetype of what it is today, a very well-known uh, obsession and consumption of beauty and pageantry in the daily life Filipino culture and overseas Filipino culture, which is, um, sorry, this is not working, uh, which was the um, subject addressed by um, an artist called Koken Ergen with a piece that I bring it here because some of you in the room might be familiarized with this installation, which was shown in Ilham in a collective exhibition that Kotsman and I uh, co-curated with other two colleagues. And uh, it's a larger project that the artist did on the beauty pageant uh, contest that happens annually in the OFWs, the, uh, the Overseas Filipino Workers in Israel, uh, as in many other immigrant communities of Filipino workers elsewhere, beauty pageants becomes this uh, empowering moment of representation. And so the idea was to connect, again, trans historically, uh, this moment of a colonial period in which beauty pageantry was uh, presented and enacted and performed uh, and created a certain identity. And therefore, uh, the audience had the chance to see all this specific moments. Um, I think. Yeah, the f this is for you to get a, a sense of the um, format. So they were uh, the beauty uh, queens of carnival were uh, photographed to become photographed postcard, uh, postcards, heavily circulated. So this uh, somehow was mass media and uh, the whole carnival experience of 1908 to 1936 from you can tell from the memorabilia of that event it had a lot of uh, early stages of um, what we consider nowadays mass media where uh, products and companies were promoted as well as uh, the women that are representing each of these um, provinces of the philippines i think yeah. Great. Thank, you. Thank you. Hello. Um, so Simon asked me to uh, speak um, about an interest that I have in textiles and in ways, well, I don't know if this was your question, but I think the, one of the ways in which I'm interested in textiles is to look at how the um, technology um, behind the conception of textiles can be discussed uh, in a framework that includes the discussions taking place in uh, art making and the way in which the different uh, systems of creating meaning and of um, positioning these objects in a, in a social context uh, can be discussed in the same field. So in order to do that, um, I would actually like go through uh, a few other images of a few other 
non-textile uh, at all examples, but of other technologies that um, are to be uh, brought in the same conversation with, uh, with art making. Um, so I'll, I'll try to do it very fast. So the first image is, uh, um, you see the artist Lok Chitrakar, who's one of the uh, foremost painters of, of, of Poba painting, which is the tradition, uh, an, an ancient painterly language in Nepal. Uh, it's it's uh, you know, also behind the genealogy of, of, of Tanka painting of Tibet, which might be a bit better known. Um, it's obviously a very uh, skill uh, uh, requiring uh, form of, of art painting. These large-scale paintings, like the two of them, take years to, to make. And, and, and um, um, some of the greatest Poba masters uh, could only hope to realize a few of such grand uh, works in their lifetime. But... <laughs> But Lok Chitrakar uh, also continues another tradition of uh, Poba painters in, in Nepal, and that is to uh, provide a, a medical service as well. So um, sufferers of uh, herpes zoster, which is this very painful um, viral infection, uh, would uh, traditionally go to a Poa painter to um, paint two uh, lions uh, facing the eruption directly on their skin. Um, it's something that uh, he continues to do. Um, it requires a night of fasting prior to uh, applying this, uh, um, the, the paint. And here is where the conversation gets interesting, because there is uh, several ways in which one can approach this. Um, and one is to look within the system of references that generated this, uh, this practice, and, and with, with um, all the um, medical and spiritual um, uh, 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 necessary references. Um, another one is to also like look at a uh, surprising discovery of, of uh, contemporary medicine which uh, came to the conclusion that the, the mineral pigment that gives the color white uh, traditionally in Poba painting and is also used uh, in, to represent the body of these uh, lions has antiseptic properties. Um, there is also another way to look at it, and that is through the uh, issue of class. Traditionally, Chitrakars, so the painters uh, in, in uh, Newa societies in, 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 in Nepal, like artists in most parts of the world, were in a lower caste. Um, medical services were reserved in the uh, Hindu caste hierarchy, hierarchy to uh, Brahmins. So performing this a particular medical service uh, is also uh, a way to transcend class, caste, actually. Um, this is another version of it, so for the ones who choose not to, and, and, and for women who do not want uh, uh, a chitra card to paint directly on their bodies, there's also an option of applying the same uh, pigments on a Nepali rice paper that is then uh, applied on the body of the um, sufferer um, um, and, and, and the effect is the same. The effect is the same uh, irrespective of the key in which we want to uh, interpret the effect. So both in the uh, spiritual presence of the tigers attacking the um, eruption and as a uh, source to be penetrated by the pigment. Um, yeah, we'll skip this. You pr probably like know the Marshallese uh, navigation chart, but I think I don't have time for that. Um, the other um, example is a um, dance fight ceremony that takes place every year uh, as part of a festival. Uh, um, in, in taking place in the in in in, in, the, in, in Paraguay, in an indigenous community, uh, in, as, as part of a of, of a Guarani uh, uh, community, 
And it's a very colorful festival. There's a lot of light mass. There's a lot of uh, things going on. But at the center of this festival, uh, there is a very simple um, event. And it involves two men that are very scantily dressed and without any obvious uh, mask or, or distinctive feature uh, who are engaged in this fight. And each one of them represents an animal. One represents uh, a buffalo and the other one represents um, a jaguar. And um, for everyone in the audience, there's also the very clear understanding that the jaguar is a stand-in for, uh, for, for, for their own kind, for uh, the indigenous people of, of, of the Americas, as the jaguar is an animal indigenous to the Americas. And the bull is a metaphor for the Spaniards, who also introduced this animal. So this takes place every year. Uh, Every year, two men fight uh, on equal terms, and one of them wins. So what's interesting here is uh, that you basically have the foundational tragedy uh, of uh, the people of Paraguay, the uh, colonial invasion and the uh, destruction of, of uh, of, 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 of many societies in the, on, the, on the continent being reenacted every year. So the, the possibility of, of, of this, of, 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 um, of, of history that has taken a very uh, clear turn is actually put under question, that every year things might have turned differently than they actually have. Mm, I have to skip this as well. Um, What's interesting is that this also exists in Southeast Asia, as many of you might know, uh, in, in slightly different forms, but also like surprisingly similar. So the, there, there have been, uh, for a long time, uh, fights between uh, buffaloes and tigers organized by different sultans throughout uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, there's several differences. One is that uh, uh, well, there's the, the main similarity where there is the understanding that uh, one of the animals stands for the uh, local people and the, and the other animal stands for the European colonists. It's something that famously Mr. Raffles has written in his uh, History of Java as well. Um, what's different, two, two main differences are that the animals are switched, that the buffalo is the metaphor, the standing for the... Um, people of the region, and the tiger uh, is the metaphor of the, uh, of, the, of the European invader. It's very much connected to the presence of the tiger on early uh, emblems of the uh, East India Company. And of course, the other main difference is that in this case, there were not people enacting it, but they were the real animals. Um, uh, there was always a real buffalo and a real tiger. Um, and what's interesting is that this is not an equal battle. Yeah? You don't have like two young men who you know, compete with each other. You have these two animals. And uh, you might be surprised, but uh, when you put a tiger and a buffalo together, in 90% of the cases, the buffalo actually wins. And it wins through determination and through stamina and through the ability to stand its ground. Um, so, uh, when these events happened, these events were not recurrent, they weren't part of a yearly festival, they were actually called by, usually by sultans, they were called usually at moments of, of great peril, um, as part of the, um, uh, you know, obviously like long-term long, long -term, uh, and, and slow process of occupation of the region by, uh, by European powers at different moments of, of threat, at different moments of negotiations, at different moments when uh, a process of social technology had to be implemented either as a, as a negotiation chip with the Europeans or as a reassurance uh, towards the uh, local people, such a battle would be uh, called for. And there are also like examples of battles in which for various reasons the tiger was on the cusp of winning and that's when the Sultan called it off. So, um, yeah, this was the last example.
And then yeah, and that's what is best to take steps, but we won't actually do it. All right. Um, are there any takeaway, like which we would summarize? What are some of the takeaway points about learning through exhibitions and collections? What, would, what, what do you think they are for you? You didn't ask me to speak about collections. Ex exhibitions are sort of like things. Uh, by en engaging with these things, what do you think you sort of get out of this? Or oh, well, maybe we can sort of like come back to that, and I'll sort of like broader question. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe Grace, do you want to sort of like quickly? Um, share your maybe a statement or something like that um, before we sort of like have this discussion. Hi, uh, we were asked to speak for five minutes, so I try to be precise by reading. We create myths that are too big for us to control and they come back to consume us. So Hyphen and I work with archives or go to the extent of archival building because we grew up under the nonsensical new order e educational system. They, the, the system basically teach us to be some, somewhat obedient and not critical. So we don't ask like why this is this and why this is that. The, the modes of uh, exam in school would be um, like options that you can choose or to connect uh, possible answers and questions or fill in the gaps. So there are no like essay-like forms in under the new order educational system. So som somehow we are taught to just believe, to like have faith. Um, yeah, we always believe that some, some sort of an answer or maybe hint of like how to uh, go through that terrible moment must exist from our past or from surrounding us or from some sort of um, uh, what's the word inherited attitudes that are in your body gesture in order to survive this uh, mode of militaristic education so one of the most problematic and unresolved past of Indonesia is the genocide of 1965 you would think that that was a scary moment, but I tell you there is an instance that, I ju that is just as strong as the killing of approximately 500 to 1 million people that were alle alleged as communist or communist related. This instance wasn't bloody at all. It was March 11, 1966. We were told that Sukarno had given up, that he couldn't control the killings that began in 1965. We were told that he allowed the military, particularly Suharto, to take over the control of Indonesia for the sake of its safety. We address this instance as March 11 decree, Surat Perintah 11 Maret, or in short, Super Semar. The nation building is definitely a myth making. There is no need to debate it. I will show you how funny this nation myths can be. So many of you may know Garuda which is the national symbol of Indonesia. Have you ever looked closely into Garuda? We can now count together the wings on the left side and on the right side. There are 17 feathers. Um, uh, yeah, the Garuda has 17 feathers for the wings, eight feathers for its tail, 45 feathers on its neck and body. Why do I know this in details? because our Independence Day is 17 August 1945. Can you imagine, had we proclaimed our independence on February 1st, maybe our national symbol could have been Dragonfly instead of Garuda. <laughs> but what if the myth becomes bigger than the, the nation or the ones who started the myth itself? What if it comes back in some way and consume us? Let's go back to Super Samar. This is a diorama in the National History Museum that depicts it. This is the only diorama that Suharto himself ordered directly from Edi Sunarso, the artist that was somehow trapped between the completion of the National History Museum dioramas. It was first ordered, but the whole complex of the dioramas were first ordered by Sukarno. They started making and installing by the beginning of 65. It had to stop because of the genocide and all the drama that comes with it. 
In 67, it was immediately resumed the moment Suharto got on stage. Not sure if many of you are aware of not, but the so-called Super Samar decree is never found. I mean the actual copy of it is missing, or maybe it never existed anyway, nobody knows. It took more than 10 years after the diorama installation was resumed for the museum to be opened for public. Imagine the political dramas that appear within that whole decade. Anyway, let us now go to 11 March 1977, 11 years after the Super Samar decree that had made Suharto in power. Suharto, who had ordered this diorama himself, wanted to inspect. He, ordered, he had to order it himself because this is the beginning of his myth, his own myth. And he had to choose this day, 11 March, 11 years after the so-called decree gave him this power position to do his one last inspection before finally opening the museum for public. But guess what happened? There was a flood inside the museum. There was no rain in Jakarta. There was just some sort of engineering failure that it had to flood on 11 years after the decree was made. You know, there are so many sayings like, um, Sukarno is crying, or uh, you know, the nation do not approve to such attitude. But another funny instance is that this is on the first page of Kompas, our biggest national newspaper at the time, and the photographer somehow decided to take picture in front of this one out of 48 dioramas. So this is also the Super Samar Decree diorama. So yeah. Many, of, many work have been done in relation to Edi Sunarso about his monument making, which is under Sukarno times. Um, not, not many people really look into these this dioramas, which actually by amount is impressive. There are 11 museums all over Indonesia have, that has hundreds and hundreds of dioramas all made by him. It's uh, only the national monument in Jakarta, Monas, has uh, works has this um, sort of turning point drama because it was ordered by Sukarno, then executed by Suharto. But the rest is all made in Suharto times. And the rest, even though we have, uh, ref we think we have reformed, or it is said that we have reformed in 1998, these are still the, the, the history that the children would see in national museums. So we, uh, we are interested, Hyphen and I are interested with this like hundreds little lies um, that are still accessible. And we are also really curious with uh, Pa Edi's position as an artist, how does he negotiate um, the, the state, the nation, the art that he's making? Does he even consider that it as art making? And how can an artist survive all regimes and what kind of negotiation, negotiation he has to do within his own artistic practice. So that's why we are building an archive on his dioramas. Okay. Thanks for sharing, uh, Grace. So um, maybe sort of like make it a bit sort of like unstructured. Uh, how should we sort of like do this? Do you guys have any sort of like questions you want to sort of start with or should I sort of like maybe post the first question? Yeah, can I go? Please. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess um, uh, uh, maybe it's not, not from by asking you guys question, but sort of like re reflecting on why I sort of like, uh, I found um, the stuff that you encounter in possibly museums or in sort of like, you know, dusty storage rooms called archives, or sort of like even in sort of like far from sort of like places where sites where you encounter sort of like, uh, you know, a, a place where you sort of like encounter a particular kind of like architecture. So sort of like fascinating for me is because like, you know, these are sort of like sites that is an invitation into sort of like other worlds. And, uh, and uh, the stories that they tell are sort of for me fascinating enough to hold on their own. In many ways, they're also sort of like, you know, uh, what, what actually interests me are sort of how they oftentimes sort of like challenge embedded sort of like power structures and do show us sort of like different ways in which people are able to communicate with each other, like other right? Outside of just the text. I think the visual or the olfactory 
at the sensorial sort of like aspect uh, of art doesn't get sort of talked about because we rely so much on the text to sort of like guide and anchor um, the way we sort of try to understand art. But actually, it's a very sort of like sensorial sort of like uh, experience, right? Whether we're learning from collection or archives or, or things. I wonder if uh, that's, the, that's what compels you to sort of uh, spend so much of your time looking. Do you guys have any things to, um, I mean, do you share the same experience with me or, yeah. Um, do you, uh, I wonder if you have anything to add to that. Do you have similar experiences with me? Like, is, that why, is that what? Well, I think that hearing the presentations, let's say aside from the sensorial, I think that's something that is what I see that is guiding some of our interests is also thinking about art outside of the category of art somehow. No? So there's so many manifestations of culture mm. that uh, they don't emerge specifically in the fine art or the, of the official practice of how we understand many production of art today. You know? So there is like a fascination you know, for certain wood carving that might have not categorized at a certain point as uh, a high art, you know? and we're creating so much value to that that it's important to, to rescue that. I don't know if that's uh, connected. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like, maybe just to ask more, a more concrete question is, this is your most sort of like formative sort of like encounter of art. Is it always, is it a fine art? object as in is it like a western painting that's sort of like uh you know that sort of like conventional ESO painting that brought you into this sort of like uh lifelong sort of like uh pursuit of this passion of yours or is it i is it sort of like you know informed by another experience but maybe encountering different kinds of like object i think yeah, I think it's 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 more that the, 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 this profession offers a good cover uh, to pursue very different uh, other interests that would be very difficult to find uh, an acceptable uh, social definition and uh, a source of income. So uh, it's a very good uh, cover, and it's a very good. It, it's very easy to fake that. Uh, <laughs> What, what, what one does and, and to be able to hide behind that and, and, and pursue many other uh, personal uh, and, and, and perhaps eccentric uh, interests that one might have. So that's the uh, great advantage of curating, uh, that <laughs> you can hide many, many, many weird hobbies uh, and, 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 you know, and I, I ideally even make money out of it. Um, but this is admittedly a little bit self-serving, uh, and, and, and while one should admit this, I think at the same time it's also important to still understand why, uh, you know, why, why can we get away with this, you know, why are so many people like, you know, listening to us and, and, and pay us for and, and, you know, allow us to, to hide our eccentricities um, in, 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 uh, in this work. And I think that's because there is obviously something very powerful about uh, this way of working. You talked a little bit about the uh, obviously like shifts in the overall um, uh, cultural paradigm, um, and uh, I think there is there there are different uh, and, and and competing impulses in it. I mean, I think there's also there's uh, on one hand. Uh, um, dangerous and toxic but present uh, 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 you know I impulse to to possess and to 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 uh, discover and and, and, and that, uh, you know otherwise very problematic impulse that is there um, but there's also a more um, you know potentially progressive uh, effort to find organization and, and to find uh, arrangement and to find access uh, into this 
into in, into a deluge of information. So there's something of the old world of of of, of colonial possession and, and and colonial ownership of knowledge. But there's also in the sa within the same uh, type of practice, there's the uh, very much needed process of of um, of, of bringing order, bringing logics, bringing key, bringing narratives into the, an uh, existing and overwhelming mass of information that is now available. It's a bit going in all directions. I, I think maybe my, my first encounter with art was through, uh, like in my, my mother's office lobby, there's the one painting. Uh, it's a painting of Radin Saleh, which of course years later I, I learned that it's fake. Uh, that was my first <laughs> encounter with art, but I cannot forget the image because it's basically a, a lion eating a horse. I was like, poor horse. Why do people put it in, in like uh, in an office lobby? Why does it need to be, why does it look like it's important? Because, you know, there are marks, you can't go near it. You, don't, you, can't, you can't touch it. As a kid, you want to run around. So that was my first encounter with it. And I, I was never really interested in Raden Saleh. And suddenly there was a show of Raden Saleh in Jakarta. Oh, finally, a retrospective. But then you learn that the show is... Uh, it's done by a German institution. It's, it's curated by a German uh, art historian uh, who is definitely the world expert on Raden Saleh. So I've, I don't feel like I can own Raden Saleh as like an Indo like what, Indonesian painter or uh, someone who creates image from things that also exist around me. Then I learned again it, it's it, it definitely is difficult because the images that Raden Saleh generated or painted uh, comes from most likely the zoo that he made uh, near his house in Chikini, in Jakarta, uh, which he could afford because he came back after painting for the uh, painting in I forgot, but somewhere in Europe. But after painting abroad, then he came back back to Indonesia. Then he made his own zoo so he can paint those images. But anyway, that's how I'm reading it. And this, this zoo is now an art school. I mean, th there is now an art school. It's Jakarta Arts Institute. And also uh, Taman Ismail Marzuki, the, f the very first government-built art center. Well, that is my interest in the arts, I think. Like, there are lots of ways to look at things and to make things make sense or uh, re re refuse other people's senses. That's, I, exhibitions is just one way to do it. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to do it with, with art. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what would you sort of like add to this, Michelle? Because I think you gave a very specific example of the right. uh, Limuhua thing, right? Mm -mm. In the, uh, that you saw as a sort of student at yes. the National Museum, uh, at the mm -hmm. NUS sort of like museum. Mm -hmm. um, would, you, would you consider that as your sort of like that was my first, yeah, first significant encounter. encounter, but surprisingly, the, actually the first artwork I think I can remember now is all the dioramas at the National Museum of Singapore <laughs> that I recently re saw again. But that's the image that stuck with me as well. Um, but so for me, from a, coming from a more education point of view, it's about how we can use the exhibitions in the museum to translate that into, um, into curriculums across NUS to see how they can use the visual image um, to see alongside their work and to break them apart for just from reading all these various texts, but to look at the visual image as another way of analysis or to complement uh, what they are reading as another way of analysis. So one of the things that I do a lot, which I didn't share here yet, was that I work with our lecturers across the university to bring them to the museum. And this is not just about art history or history, um, because NUS doesn't have fine arts, and only recently did we have art history in 2015, but it's only a minor. So we had to go all out to all the other different departments and disciplines across NUS to reach out to them to see how can they, how would you want to use the museum as part of your academic curriculums? How, how can we help you? How can we support your teaching? How can we infuse experiential learning into, into your curriculums to make it more interesting and 
um, more constructive for your students to look at. So I'm very glad we are at UHAM today because I can use the Rediscovering Time Masters of Photography show to give you a very concrete example. So that show was at NUS Museum before this. And if you look at the works by ML Toy Sumsai about the female nude, we use that across modules that look at the female um, new uh, the female image in artworks and for students to analyze these artworks rather than just looking at an image in their book they could come down to the museum look at a range of practices not just of ML toy but the rest of the museum of other females involved and compare that regionally between Thailand Singapore and the rest of Southeast Asia as well so um, that's one of the ways that we tangentially bring in different types of curriculums um, into the museum so sociology has used the exhibition um, on Thai masters, communications and me new media have used that same um, exhibition as well, history um, as well as uh, the arts history as well. So it, it kind of opens up the range of things that we can do uh, with art and not just restrict ourselves just to art history or fine arts. Yeah. Do you have any sort of like successes in bridging arts and sciences? Uh, it mm. seemed like, um, I guess, I can imagine how a broad base of like humanities program yes. would be able to benefit from using the mm -mm. museum quite uh, as a pedagogical sort of mm -hmm. like tool. But uh, in terms of like the sciences, uh, would you have any sort of like success stories? Because I know that is yeah. an area that a lot of museums in mm. uh, America have been sort of like exploring. Yeah. And if you have any sort of like, um, I don't have a concrete models. like yeah, hard share. science example, but um, we have classes from engineering coming into the museum. Okay. Um, they use the museum as the space rather than just the artworks as well. So the museum itself becomes the object, I suppose, okay. in that sense. They look at the engineering and everything. They look at how to build museum galleries. Uh -huh. They look at sound. Um, architects look at how they design gallery spaces. Marketing students look at how you can write copy for a museum. Mm. So we let them use that museum for that sense okay. um, as well. And of course, uh, architecture students go to the NUS Baba House, okay. which is also under our, our care. So it's a three-story shop house in the middle of town. It's 19th century. And they actually do like physical work making lime plaster um, to plaster on the walls and to test what works best for the house. And um, we do that together in, with the house in Malacca that we also own, the, the NUS owns, sorry, the Tun Tan Cheng Lok Centre. So they mix the lime in Malacca, bring the lime down to Singapore, plaster it on the walls, and then test over a year whether which lime makes sure works the best. Mm -hmm. So there's that physical like, um, work involved as well, not just reading text. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys have anything else to share? I mean, uh, Parasite runs an exhibition sort of program as well, right? Uh, sorry, uh, education sort of like program. And um, in some ways, uh, as a non-profit sort of like center, I imagine that you also, you are given a sort of like wide ambit in order to sort of uh, try out different kinds of like ways in which you are able to sort of like engage different kinds of like public uh, with the sort of like exhibitions that you stage. I uh, uh, was wondering if you could share with some of your experience. Um, yeah, this was something that you know we, we've developed over the past uh, years, and I think throughout this period we tried to um, understand what are like the different um, categories of public that we can best serve, and what are the different ways to engage with. Um, and uh, I mean, especially an institution of our size wouldn't be able to, you know, to to to. Uh, aim to uh, you know touch all sectors of the public like a, like like a museum would do. Um, I mean there was this whole process of like engaging in different ways with the uh, migrant domestic worker community, and that was uh, connected. Well, that was actually the what what led to the exhibition that Inti mentioned and was was presented here at Ilham, and that was like a, a very specific program that was developed with the community and it offered like very different types of um, um, services, I would say. Uh, um, but then, you know, I think, and, and I think that was like interesting in terms of, of and, 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 and it had like a strong impact in the process of, of, of um, um, creating uh, spaces for the community. Um, um, it's also like a very fragile process, so it's something that you know needs to be, you know, cons constantly renegotiated. Um, I think what at the moment sort of like the um, 
strongest kind of like um, uh, aspect of our education program is, is is more connected to like young professionals as we call them as, a, as an umbrella term to include young curators but also researchers and writers uh, in the field so um, there is we do an intensive educational program every year it's it's connected to an international conference we're also like organizing so it's a it's very very intensive process of being together for 10 days and learning from each other and learning from tutors and trying to unlearn many things as well um, but we're also like offering um, the opportunity of projects to be realized at Parasite um, to young curators. So there's like a smaller one that is uh, open to people who, of, of alumni of this, prog of, of this program, but then there's another completely independent program where people can apply and they get the chance to realize under our mentorship somehow um, a project of their, uh, that, that they devise. Uh, great. Um, so, Grace, I uh, wanted to sort of like um, maybe uh, get you to sort of share, at, you know, uh, at least with um, uh, Michelle and sort of like Cosmin, they're attached to uh, larger sort of like institutions with some kind of like funding structure that will allow for uh, a committed or sustained sort of like set, uh, education sort of like program to be designed, right? But you working in a research initiative that is uh, designed to be design uh, uh, that emerge out of a collective, they emerge out of the conversation, and it's meant to be as unstructured as possible so that you can adapt flex flexibly to different ways of thinking about sort of re research. How do you see the relation, how, how do you connect the research that you do to uh, a, a larger kind of like maybe an educational sort of like goal for your collective hyphen? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you consciously sort of like think of that or is that not something that is so yeah, of immediately? Course. Yeah. Mm, for particularly for the Edi Sunarso research, uh, we work with IKJ, with the Jakarta Art School. And it's a bit ironic that we are working with Jakarta instead of working with uh, the Art Institute, Indonesia Art Institute in Jogja, which he used to teach. And the city which he lived, work and finally die in. <laughs> Uh, it's it's maybe also very related to like how do we work with our government <laughs> in a way because it's it's all public schools like the, uh, IKJ, EC, and also ITB is somewhat public school. And I of course we tried asking the art school in Jogja would you uh, we we don't necessarily need money to do this, but how can we do it together? For example, they have money for publishing. They can print like 10,000 copies and, and we can distribute it for free. That's one way of doing it. Instead of only putting things online, which you know exactly what kind of public you are reaching by putting things online. We, we think about it and we constantly think about it. That's also why it has different articulations. There is an exhibition. There is we we did an archive exhibition in his ex studio uh, that is now open for public. Um, with the J uh, Jakarta Arts Institute, we are going to publish a book and of like six newly commissioned essays, which somehow we cannot pay for the writers because we're doing it on our free time. That doesn't translate to money, but the Jakarta Art School can can pay for the. Uh, designers like properly pay for the designers and also the, the new photographs that are being made and, and, and all that so it's it's navigating between so many things and so many source sources of fun but of course we are thinking of distributing these things I mean why gather it if we only did it for ourselves anyway we could just go into his um, studio knock the door and and look at it and leave it there mm. but we also digitize everything yeah. uh, in the hope that at some point we can hand it over to the Indonesian Visual Art Archive, which runs an online archive. But at this point, this digitization actually somehow found, uh, found money from a National Gallery of Singapore, its resource center, and um, at this point we are in, in negotiation with the family, whether we can share the whole archive or not, and if not, which ones we can share and which ones we cannot, because those are sensitive materials. So it's meant to be 
it's made to be open eventually, but it needs like uh, time and you know test junctions and all that. <laughs> Indeed, do you, um, I know you're only recently sort of like um, uh, appointed and you have uh, maybe a few months, uh, close to a year now of being in the office. Uh, have you sort of like started um, working on an education program or do you want to sort of like suggest what you might be sort of like doing? Are there sort of specific sort of like concerns that are, or maybe models from Latin America, which is, you come from sort of like Colombia. Uh, Columbia, right? And are there different ways of sort of like thinking about education that you could possibly sort of like share with us? Uh, well, I, I, I think the, the, whole, the, whole dis the whole discussion of uh, education in, in the past 10 years is definitely a, uh, an institutional phenomenon. If people are interested, uh, there is actually a book called The Educational Turn. Uh, and it manifests how yet yeah, the there is a curatorial shift in mm. some institutional practice of curating educational programs. No, but that it really becomes another medium of, uh, in the same way that one associates artwork, you start to associate topics or curriculum. No, so the idea of imagining a curriculum uh, in an independent. Uh, unconventional, non-educational setting uh, is in itself a creative medium, no? Um, in that regard, uh, obviously, th there has been since the 90s like a boom of the curatorial education and somehow that has been replicated uh, in many platforms and across geographies. Uh, at Bellas Artes, the institution that I'm working at, uh, perhaps uh, trying to make uh, something different uh, outside of the idea of training uh, curators. We came up with uh, an educational platform which is called Escuela. Uh, there's a website which uh, describes better every single topic, but precisely trying to distance ourselves from the idea of creating a curatorial uh, initiative or a curatorial curriculum we wanted to uh, build on the fact that in Manila there's already like an amazing um, educational ecosystem, like the universities, both public and private, that exist in the humanities and in the arts uh, have a huge uh, tradition and it produces uh, incredible knowledge. It's uh, widely connected to Anglo-Saxon or translated to English critical theory because of the accessibility of the language and again because it's uh, been uh, last I mean the Philippines is a context where you can easily find like female art critics who did their PhD at the University of the Philippines in their 30s no so you can imagine that how that reverberates to the present so however this fields from our perspective um, most of the humanities and the arts are quite separated. They don't uh, in, like intermingle, to put it that way. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to create a curriculum that was like a bit of a free school kind of idea where anybody, no matter from what field they came from, they could take courses on dance and choreography or a topic that we're calling is called Queer Filipiniana. I mentioned the term Filipiniana at the beginning of the presentation where uh, it is uh, this vast cult material culture uh, that most of this material culture is highly um, dictated by representations of family, the nation, and identity in general, but the family and the nation become a uh, constant uh, leitmotif of uh, depictions of Filipiniana. And of course, the notion of family is very heteronormative, no? So uh, the photographs that you saw of the beauty pageant, they constructed an ideal of beauty and of femininity in the early 20th century. And so in this topic in our educational program called Queer Filipiniana, we're bringing professors or teachers who are already looking at uh, for example, the 
representation of queerness in Filipino cinema of, uh, across the 20th century. And so uh, curators, artists, or whoever can take these courses, no? And um, it's called Escuela, partly because in relation to the um, uh, name of our institution, Bellas Artes, which in Spanish is Bellas Artes, is the name of the Escuela de Bellas Artes, the fine arts school. That's where the institution brings its uh, name from. And so uh, somehow the idea of creating our program Escuela was a way to uh, bring back this notion of the art school. But what, what could be an art school today? Maybe it might be more interesting for an art critic to take a uh, dance course, or in, a, in terms of experimenting. We don't, we don't know what's gonna happen, no? Right. Yeah. Okay. I have a question for yeah. Grace. So I was just wondering, um, with all the high schoolers that are being lied to, how are you reaching out to them through your archive? No, just for Grace. Yeah, because she mentioned that the high schoolers are still being lied to. They're still going to see the murals, but Hyphen is working on creating the archive. So how you, I'm wondering how do you reach out to them to kind of change the tide, so to speak, even little bit by little bit. Is there any um, initiatives that are coming up or in place already? It's, there are so many Indonesians to reach. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But we, we <laughs> bit by bit. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. At this point, there is one something that is graspable, which is a podcast project that I'm working towards with. Uh, actually, I will be working on with the next batch of students of Good School. The what is Good School? The Ruang Rupa Serum and Grafis Huruhara runs a new site in um, southern part of Jakarta and it has a one-year program school, a non-formal educational platform that they are experimenting on next year. Huh? These are for, there is no age limit, but you are expected no. to uh, not always have to ask your parents to do what you do. I think it's okay. it's written in that manner also in their website. It's it's uh, it looks like it's not so serious, but it's a one-year program. So it's actually looking at the first batches have been really interesting. So I'm asked to teach. So I'm using this material, uh, the Eddie Sunarso, and so many iterations of it as a class. It's the class is called articulation and curation, something like that, and. With the students, I, after so many conversations with the school, uh, we decided that the class needs to be practical in a way. So it's not just like speaking about abstracts and concepts and presenting exhibitions, but it's about uh, pro pro product making. So the podcast is the product. Also aiming to, uh, because many people now actually are in the space for picnic rather than actually looking at the museums uh, be because you are not forbid to like bring food and all that so actually some of them still bring radio uh, like boom box and all that in in that that side maybe now it's bluetooth speaker but so looking at that i think that may be one one way to invade without officially being, uh, you know, doing things. We can pop, make it popular by working with uh, influencers in Instagram, which somehow have, have uh, it seems like it's, uh, it, it immediately creates lots of followers. It's been experimented in different projects. Uh, yeah, even in the arts. I will, I will personally test it out this August in a different context, but if that way can work, you know, 2.5 million followers in a month, you can completely change the way young people look at the past or experience the past through like this, you know, endorsed kind of photographs on Instagram. I don't know, that's one way to do it. Sorry, how, how do you work with influencers? Do you have to pay them uh, for... They're our it's, friends. Oh, they're friends, okay. <laughs> but an influencer, for those who, I guess, there will be some of us who don't know what an influencer is. Can you describe, actually? 
<laughs> How was the definition of an influencer? Is it like you have to have 15,000 followers before you're considered an influencer? 15,000, is that the benchmark? Yes. Okay. World okay. Bank. 50. 50. 50. Not, 50. Oh, Indonesia is 50. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What world, no? no I, I mean, I there are really, lots of Indonesians, so I think I don't look right. to the ones below 50. Yeah, yeah, That's I guess. No. <laughs> 15 is like, yeah, you're nothing, right? <laughs> Who has 15,000 followers here? <laughs> no one? <laughs> okay, clearly we're not in the right company <laughs> to do educational work. <laughs> And you have 15,000, uh, 50,000 followers, friends. No, uh, no, that's her. That's not, not, doesn't have to be me, but there are people with really like 1 that million, 2 million people. followers yeah. that, uh, that are actually interesting in terms of their personal projects, not because they, they, they appear on TV and all that, but they have interesting in individual projects with, with, with NGOs, with artists and all that. So, Th those are the people that I'm, th I'm thinking about. Right, okay. Do you, do you guys have other sort of like strategies in which you do outreach? Uh, maybe Michelle, for someone who actually, actually your second portfolio is outreach, right? Uh, how do you sort of then, um, you know, uh, respond to something like uh, the creative use of influencer? Um, uh, is, is that something that's possible within a much more sort of like uh, uh, structured sort of like institution? I suppose oh, uh, so. Yeah. I'm not very good at social media. Right. Um, museums outreach is really education programs right. and anything else, collections and curator don't want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it comes to me. But my parent department runs marketing. But one of the things that we're trying to see we can reach out to is campus influencers. Not all publications, like small student publications, Instagrams or interested individuals. These are very small, like 100, 200 or so. But these are students who are doing something, are interested in something. So we want to reach out to them too. Um, to, to talk to them, to connect with them. Even in just a few hundred, it could still be something of note. Um, at least to try to tell them that, hey, the museum is open. Um, we are happy to work with you to do what you want. So I remember telling a student who likes to meme artworks on her Instagram stories, I was like, just come, uh, just meme our artworks. I want to see what you come up with creatively to, to comment about artworks in an art historical way because that's what they like. So I, I'm, I invited them to do it. I haven't seen it yet, but I would really like to see what they come up with. And we could even reshare them just to show that we have a... Um, it's not all about art history with a capital A and H, you know. But it's also yeah. not all about food traffic. Yeah, it's not about food traffic, it's exactly. About, uh, yeah. engagement yeah. is something more meaningful mm. than sort of like yeah. that, right? It's, um, it's an opportunity to have a conversation That's right. with someone. Yeah. yeah, we have found that film screenings have been an extremely productive way. Um, to circle around the exhibition's various thematics, but not quite, but also opening up the conversations through other visual media or other things that the filmmakers themselves are speaking about. Yeah. Okay. And how would you sort of like program a film screening uh, oh. to accompany and sort of like exhibition? Like, right. is that thematically sort of like tied to subjects that were addressed through the exhibition? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So re last year we did a film screening. Oh, sorry. Earlier this year we did a film screening called Two Sides of the Same Lens that look at migration, diaspora, um, that kind of circled around the three exhibitions that we had, Crossings by Wei Ling Tay, um, of Place and the Paradox on Patani art, art, uh, Patani art Space. And using those themes, we pulled out um, my colleague, who actually does the film screenings, looked at various films uh, from a macro going down towards a micro view involving five films that was um, screen over 10 weeks or so, so it's almost like a little season of, of these five films. Um, we started with Ai Weiwei's film. I for, I'm sorry, I forgot the names right now, but we did show Sherman Ong's as well of, of uh, Flood and Drought, who is in the program, so very happy to see him here. Um, and then we did that over like two weeks, and then we also did... Um, I forgot my own films, everybody. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, but we did this five films, yeah. So it had an international perspective and then coming downwards to local, regional, yeah. Um, maybe with the rest of the time, uh, we still have an hour more. Did, uh, does anyone have any sort of like questions or do you have sort of comments and ideas that you want to sort of like share with us? Yes. Uh, uh, could you sort of... Um, how should we do this? Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you. 
Hello. Yeah, um, oh, I should stand up, I guess. Yeah. So, hello. Um, my question was, uh, and I think you partly answered, but I'd like to see it rounded up, maybe. When you go to an exhibition, it's always very nice. I mean, I love them. The problem is, most of the time, you need a how. So my question is, how do you give as m much comprehension and understanding of an artwork or cultural work, whatever, but without overwhelming the person with information? So the question is, how do you balance, how do you think you can balance between um, just watching something, art, an art form, an art form, sorry, and thinking, wow, it's beautiful and being interested in it, or just looking at something that you would not find interesting in the first place, but when you do give explanations to that, then the person thinks, oh, I'm actually learning something here, and I want to know more about that. So that's my question. Okay. Uh, is that directed to everyone? That's to everyone. Okay. Um, anyone want to sort of like take a stab? Well, I mean, what we normally do is to just give exactly the um, uh, amount of information that is needed and nothing more. Um, my question is how do you know which one is needed and how do you actually bore the person or not bore them? Like, how do you... I, okay, I mean, the, well, the bored part, you know, that, that's not, you know, it's, I think people can also be bored. I think it's also part of the you know, range of emotions and, and experiences one can have in, a, in, a, in an art gallery. But I, I, I'll try to, I mean, to, to answer concretely, um, I mean, there is, uh, you know, in the context of, 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 of being in an exhibition and, and, and you know, reading a label, um, there are artworks that have concrete information that certainly helps the process of encountering them. Um, and you provide that range of information, but we would normally abstain from uh, giving our own interpretation, for example. Um, so we wouldn't really uh, engage in that context in interpreting and in, in translating the work, in, uh, work or, 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 or mediating. So uh, usually our labels are quite factual in that sense. You know, so and, and, and they can also be of like different length. There are there are exhibitions where there are works without any explanation whatsoever. If we think that that's actually not necessary, in some cases it can be a very um, you know simple and stern sentence like you know the woman in the picture is the artist's mother um, and that's it uh, without you know going into details about what does that that actually mean and what are the psychoanalytical implications of that. But you might just need to know that the the, that's the artist's mother. Um, and in some cases, it can be a much longer label, but I mean, you know, different people get bored at different uh, levels of effort. Um, but the length would be, in some cases, you need to tell a story, and the story can, can, can be long. But if you indeed focus on telling a story rather than, you know, your own uh, essayistic interpretation, I think um, a, a good part of the audience could be quite engaged to actually, like, read even a long label. I'll take a step at that as well. Um, we actually have archival binders that we have in the museum. Um, so these are separate from the artwork labels. So if someone wanted to go further into a particular work, a particular section, they go to those binders if they want more. So they make their choice if they um, need more information. And if what's on the walls is enough, then it is enough for them. So, yeah. There, I, yeah, there's not one single strategy. I, one of the, uh, uh, let's say, curatorial uh, museum design possibilities is that the mere fact that a work is next to another, maybe that other work is actually giving you another information to that work. So some, there is these moments of symbiosis of that had you not seen a work prior to the other, you wouldn't get the story that you're trying to convey in terms of um, whatever the exhibition is. I personally enjoy, as a viewer, nowadays more recently labels, speaking of labels, <laughs> um, in which there's, on one hand, I'm enjoying those where there's um, more information about the provenance of the work in terms of uh, custodianship, ownership, not, not in a very, I mean, not uh, listed, but 
when they tell you a, a story like this, the Boogie Woogie of Mondrian was owned by Maria Martins, a Brazilian artist who uh, was uh, in the circles mm -hmm. of Marcel Duchamp and who happened to be the wife of the Brazilian ambassador and they gave the Boogie Woogie to MoMA as mm -hmm. an acquisition, you know? So I've started to think like, wow, this is like, you, you, like the, the history that is embodied in this object. And also obviously in this moment of decolonization, con conscience of many institutions, uh, more and more often you actually see courageous museums where they've kind of like changed the main narrative of their masterpieces or their masters. Uh, most recently, uh, just to put an example, in Brazil, uh, a very well-known painter from the early 20th century called uh, Portinari, who painted a lot of uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, peasantry, to put it that way, in terms of iconography, yet he was a lighter-skinned, white, Italian uh, descendant uh, Brazilian. Mm -hmm. And these facts were not, uh, would not be described in a label, let's say, 20 years ago, or not, even seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And now it's more constant to find, like, the man that you are seeing used to work in the farm of the painter, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, those things uh, are important moments that are shifting the ways of informing the audience, not to just be uh, mesmerized by the image, but to question who, uh, the power, the uh, power structures and social contexts that determine who represents who, you know? Um, maybe I'll sort of also take a stab at sort of answering you. So if you look at, you know, the museological stuff like manual, you often find like, I, I think you can even download online, VNA would sort of like have it, right? Uh, if you have a main sort of like section text, it's maximum 240 words or something like that, or 220 words. And if you have the sort of like uh, smaller sort of like wall text, it's 120. Uh, and so you try to sort of like work within the confines and these are sort of like prescriptive sort of like ways, uh, which I think offers very interesting sort of like challenges because you're then sort of like forced to think, right, how much you can sort of like communicate in the 120 sort of like word. Uh, uh, what sort of like perhaps Inti suggested, the way of sort of like thinking about how artworks, when they put next to each other, do sort of like suggest relationships and uh, communicate uh, maybe certain issues and themes uh, uh, that are not sort of so immediately sort of like visi visible in the work if it's sort of like hung on its own, uh, could potentially be something that you want to explore in say a 240 word sort of like main sort of like section text. But I would like to think that in the sort of like uh, smaller label text, you could sort of like explore sort of like micro sort of like stories, right? But principally, I guess how you would sort of like know whether you are going overboard or not doing sort of like enough of sort of like communication boils down to really two things. It's really, you have to know what it's, who are the audiences that you want to speak to. Uh, it's as uh, simple as sort of like, you know, really understanding what, who, who are the audiences that you want to build for this exhibition, right? And not just what the audience is that's coming to the museum, but who are the audiences you want to sort of cultivate through this exhibition. The second is really to practice by imposing a kind of like restraint on this creativity, right? Uh, practice and practice and practice. 120 words, I think the best sort of like platform and the best sort of like format to practice on is actually Instagram. It's true, <laughs> it actually sort of like forces you to sort of like clarify what you want to sort of say. And it's a lot of fun too, you can do it on a daily sort of practice. Yeah. Uh, uh, Wing? Thank you. Um, Simon, so speaking of Instagram, your posts tend to be a little bit longer than 120. Yeah, it's 2,500, it's 2,400 words characters. Yeah. Um, but that's also a very, very interesting um, space, right, to, to, to negotiate. So could you just elaborate a little bit more about your own sort of Instagram practice? I don't want to talk about my Instagram because it's a bit of a diary and also a place for me to sort of like write stuff that I would eventually want to include in other longer essays. Uh, but I find it as 
an interesting sort of like format only because it sort of like allows you a bit more room than the 140 sort of like word count to expand on an idea, to make certain sort of like uh, notes that you want to sort of like revisit. And it also allows, I, I guess it has that visual sort of like component that's tagged to uh, the particular text that you're writing, right? Or something that you're reflecting on. And that, is, that visual cue that is actually the main thing that drives Instagram is actually almost sort of like secondary to the way I use Instagram in the way that it's sort of actually a sort of like reminder. It's a place so there are sort of like signposts of something that I, I an idea I want to sort of like think through writing. So uh, principally, I write mostly. I'm interested in writing and uh, uh, engaging with the visual is in some. Uh, I I use that to sort of like remind me of certain sort of like things. But I, the the issue of your Instagram practice, I think, really addresses the question earlier. You know about how to think of an exhibitionary form. In this case, you know the the uh, the visual uh, information that Instagram communicates, but then feeling how you can then deepen and layer that access. So in some ways, you you have the image, you you know get someone's attraction, and then if they want to sort of uh, continue reading through you know your uh, disquisition, you know your your long caption. So I, I, that's why I wanted right. you to elaborate because I really feel that it addresses the. I wish I, I wish I curate my Instagram a bit more, <laughs> but honestly, it's just place like dumb sort of like <laughs> words and images. Just to remind of myself that there's this thing I've experienced. No, I, I don't want to tell <laughs> okay. I'm not going to share it. <laughs> what does it mean? So, uh, what does it mean? It just means Simon soon. <laughs> yeah. It's, people call me that in Indonesia. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, any other question? <laughs> uh, yes, hold. Um, so, I have, um, so I have a question for all four, five of you. Um, so it actually stems from one of the projects that I'm currently looking into. So um, I'm in the process of uh, proposing an idea with, um, with the Department of Biology at the University of Natural Sciences in Ho Chi Minh City, where I'm based at. Um, so the project is particularly looking into the history of a current invasive plant in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. So to listening to you talk about like um, ar archives, exhibition, colonial ownership of knowledge, how do you communicate with the public and how does this uh, informing process happen? Um, I kind of it relates to my project. So I'll, I'll, I guess I'll start with Michelle because uh, you uh, you talk about like um, the pro I'm I'm mean, curious about what you say like when you say translate exhibition into curriculum. So like I'm really curious about how that happens because educational process and educational projects is also an important part of what I'm thinking of doing with the with the biology department. So like um, I'm just wondering like how does the broad brainstorm process happen? Who are the people that you involve? And what are kind of the output that you looking for in this um, translation between exhibition and curriculum. Um, for uh, Cosmin, um, you talk about uh, the colonial ownership of knowledge, which is very interesting because a lot of these university um, structure were built out of, at least in Vietnam, it was built based on, based on the French colonial structure. And it's very much about like this owning knowledge. Knowledge doesn't get out of the ivory tower so I guess like in the case of Parasite, like how did you address that in your exhibition, in your communication, as well as in your programming? And uh, how does that come as a topic in the discussion of exhibition making? Because um, I think I need to consider that as well when I address this topic. Um, for, for, I think for um, Inti, I guess we kind of talk about like this briefly during the, during the workshop, but like the ideas of the archives. Because the, arch um, the school does have an archive, um, just that it's horribly unorganized, dilapidated, and everything is shoved into the storage room, basically, as with most other archives um, in the region. Um, so my question is that if, work, like, if in your experience working with the archive and the exhibition, like which inform which, or is it like a circulatory um like, it, like, how does information circulate between archive and exhibition? 
um, and how does how do you navigate that process? And also, I guess like yeah, sort of like digging deeper into like the process of interacting with an archive, building archive in not only because you also said Escuela is a, is an educational project. So how do you kind of bridge all of those roles together in your process? As for Grace, I'm, Grace, I'm just interested in like, um, because you, um, I know that Indonesia has like a huge, huge um, thing for Instagram. Like every single art space I've gone to in Indonesia has an Instagram. Every single artist has an Instagram. So like, I'm just wondering like how, how does a project that bridge uh, natural sciences and contemporary art, how do we make use of Instagram and Facebook? And kind of like these influencers that you're talking about, like so do I get a professor to make an Instagram and then he in turn like post selfie of himself in the lab? Like is that how we go at it? Or do we go in and like post selfie with um, specimens of trees? Is that what you're doing? I'm just, just curious, like, how do you curate that um, Instagram experience to draw in people? Because I think it's important, like, nowadays students only look at Instagram and Facebook and only a few other media channels as their way of interacting with the world at large. So it's important to, at least for someone who's doing project, to make use of that. Yeah. Um, I guess, and if Simon, if you have anything to add into that as well, that'd be great. I'm sorry, it's a mouthful, so. As you brought up the, the project that you're proposing, do you want to introduce it very quickly? Um, it's a project that came out of a, of a residency that I did in NTU CCA last year. Um, so it was to look at a plant, a specific invasive plant in, uh, in the region of Southeast Asia, it's called Lantana Camara. You can find it everywhere. It was shipped over from the Americas um, in the 19, late 19th to early century uh, via colonial route. So it first spread from, I think, Mexico and the Central America region all the way to, uh, I think, India first. And then it slowly creeps its way to, um, to um, Southeast Asia. I talked to Grace briefly about this plant, like this is incredible plant that you know, refuse any kind of destruction. It's fire resistant, it can't be burned because of the, there's a kind of wax covering its leaf. It can, it can grow on soils that has been destroyed, soil that has been um, denutrient, uh, that lack nutrition, it even grows in saline area. But it's being, uh, uh, and it's also being turned into a commodities in like these ornamental plant, urban landscaping plant as well. So I'm interested in how like this, like this, um, uh, this plant that has been brought over here via the colonial route is becoming consumed, commodified, and also nativized in a sense. Because when I ask people like, do you know that this plant is actually not from here? They're like, no, it has always been around. Like we grow them to like create fences, bushes. Some of them, some of them uh, even use it for like medicinal qualities. But um, nobody knew it's actually not from here. Like, and it's become so much of the background of the landscape that people don't notice it anymore. Um, so we kind of, I kind of want to kind of just oppose that with what I propose with the university is that I just oppose this plant with like the influx of migrants that go from, from the countryside into the city or from one country to another. It's like they become so much a part of the background that nobody noticed they're not from here until like someone used them either as a scapegoat or to pinpoint them as, oh, you're not native. And then all of these stories start coming out. So I'm just, that's why I'm proposing the idea of working with the biology department. I'm still waiting to hear from them. Hopefully they'll, they'll consider my proposal. Hello, oh, okay. Um, how we get classes into the museum? <laughs> Translate exhibitions. Um, every start of the school year, I look at the list of modules available. I scroll through the entire list and find keywords in whatever 100 word paragraph they may use for a module description to find links with whatever exhibitions we have ongoing or whatever artwork is in our collection that I think could Work with the mod, work with them. Even the tiniest, teeniest link, I will take and email them and cold call and ask them what you want the 
come to the museum and work with us. On. We have this, 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 this. We have a classroom. We have a audiovisual capabilities. Bring your class, bring your class to the museum. So, um, yeah. So I just have to be very, very thick skin about it, just to write to them and start that first email going, and then hopefully things will come flooding back. Um, and after that, when we when we meet, and then I start to figure out from them what their syllabus is about, what they're doing week by week. And I start to look, try to draw um, more intricate links between the exhibition and, and, and their classes, and also to co work together to see what sort of activities would best suit the class. Because a class can be 20 people, a class could be 400 people, and that requires different types of logistics and different kind of assignments or interactions needed that would best um, suit them. So, you need a lot of logistics thinking goes into it. The content is really actually just the tip of the iceberg when we translate our exhibitions into the curriculums. Um, and then sometimes it's just an hour. Sometimes it could be a whole 12-week 12, 12 class. So it really is a whole range of, of things to think about and to propose to them. So uh, you have to come with a proposal, basically, because likely they would not have thought of it to use the museum for... Uh, for education, as an education space, even at the university level, in my experience, for Singapore, for NUS at least, lah. Yeah. You, yeah. Your question was directed uh, to everybody. To everyone. everyone. For okay. every, he, he had one for each. Yeah, each, each question. <laughs> okay. And so, yeah, in the case of um, the how to work with archives, uh, not to reiterate, but uh, having the archive literally in the exhibition space is also an important juxtaposition. So those uh, black and white vintage photographs of early 20th century Manila Queen carnivals, the fact that, that they were at close proximity to a video installation of an artist in 2009 uh, representing a beauty pageant of Filipino beauty, <laughs> Filipino beauty pageant in um, Israel by uh, overseas workers. That fact of having physically the archive created again, this um, presenting what was happening in early 20th century Manila as the archetype of that uh, uh, pageantry culture, and that creates a, a new perspective to the work of that uh, living artist to such an extent that many people that visited uh, the show uh, actually told me that they hated that work, his work, like the artist, before. Like now they kind of like understood it in, an, in a different way. Like first they thought that it was uh, misogynist, that it was also uh, wrong in a sense that a uh, Turkish man was doing a work uh, mostly portraying Filipino uh, women. Like they couldn't go through the layers that were within the show that within his work, which uh, are much uh, deep and complex than just that. Uh, they talk, it's a piece that at the end of the day actually talks more about Israel than about the pageantry. But because of having those archives inside the room, uh, it created a uh, uh, a wider perspective of why are there overseas Filipino workers everywhere doing the ritual of beauty pageantry? Like there's something embedded in culture historically that creates this. Anyway, uh, just uh, another example. Uh, in Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong, I was invited uh, to produce a uh, a small display, very modest, in their library space, uh, reacting to whatever I could find in the vast uh, data, information, digitized archives that they have. And I made specifically a, a proposal uh, based on uh, archives that are related to uh, music, experimental compositions of a very interesting avant-garde figure called Jose Maceda. Uh, which was an ethnomusicologist and a concrete music composer. Yeah, for people who are interested, you have to uh, dig into him. 
But the idea of the show was precisely not to just make a display of the archives, but to understand the archive as an active object that you could associate with other aspects. And this Maceda artist was extremely related to uh, the Marcos regime, so how do you convey that to an audience, not just by a label saying like, this happened under the umbrella of the CCP and its patronage of Imelda Marcos, but how to bring another artist like Pio Abad, who he himself as a contemporary artist has devoted most of his uh, body of work to memorabilia, critically looking at the state cultural policy of the Marcos regime. No? So um, again, uh, there were archives visually presented in the display, but also I, think, I guess my interest is also to associate those images and material culture to the production of artwork or filmmaking. No? Yeah. Something there? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, because there's, well, I guess like several, uh, well, you asked me about the, 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 the question of, of, of uh, colonial knowledge and I think there's, there's several layers there. Um, I mean, I, on one hand, this is like an everyday practice and it's something that, you know, it, it should inform every decision that one does when, when, when running an institution. It's something in the very ethos of, of should be in the very ethos of every decision one makes. It's about the um, decisions on like the people that one works with. It's about the themes that one explores. It's about the way they're, they're, they're being presented. Um, but there's also like very specific, um, I mean, if, if I am to give specific examples, I mean, there's um, one should definitely like be, uh, very much aware in the way in, in, in which one, one, one communicates the kind of like knowledge that is presented, that one should not be discovering things, one shouldn't be, um, you know, serving them as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a manual of information that often like reduces things. Uh, one should be very mindful when one speaks in a former colonial context, when, when an exhibition is taken uh, to Europe. Uh, um, you know, we had this like often when we had um, I mean, to be very concrete, it's, the, uh, it's an exhibition that we uh, pr primarily produced for the Dhaka Art Summit in Bangladesh that then traveled to Hong Kong and then it traveled to Burma. And it was on the behest of the organizers primarily built uh, uh, around the, uh, an, an attempt to look at South Asia and Southeast Asia together uh, and as a way to reimagine the self-perceived geography of Bangladesh you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a country that is geographically at that, at that, at that border. Um, so it was very much part of that narrative and then you know in Hong Kong it was I guess also in, to a large extent contextualized and then you know going to Burma essentially on the other side of the South Southeast Asia conventional but very real divide you know the, 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 the most uh, bloody uh, possibly like border these days uh, or, or, or tense border but then the exhibition went to Warsaw um, and there needed to be like a very active effort to make sure that this is not an Asian show that this is not put together for you actually for you being the audience that we were talking to in, 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 in Warsaw that this is not uh, an opportunity for you to learn more about uh, Asia, that this show was put together for an Asian audience um, and you were essentially, you know, lucky to get the chance to also like see it without having to travel there, but that this is not uh, in any way uh, um, a source for you to get informed of what's going on in Asia. Uh, one can learn and one should obviously like learn whenever like one encounters a new show and that's, 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 that's totally fine, but it's basically about like how uh, one um, one approaches what is the subject of, 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 of one's learning there, and it should certainly not be a whole continent or a whole context. Um, but also, especially since when I first brought in the issue, it was more on a kind of a 
personal negotiation level, and I think that's also very important to understand how power dynamics works in general. Um, and, and in this context, we're also very keen to avoid and to boycott uh, knowledge hoarders and gatekeepers, and, and irrespective of their context, and irrespective if they're from a former colonial context. And that's, there are sadly people who colonize their own context. Um, and and, 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 and uh, um, I think that's also like a very important ethical decision to boycott such people. And it's easy to spot them. <laughs> Do you want to say something to sort of maybe the session? It doesn't always have to be Instagram. I mean, that's just one way of communicating. And I forgot how, how we got... Oh, because uh, Michelle was asking how, how to find a way to influence the, or, or to reach the, the high school students or students in general that, we, we, that I felt sorry about because they had to look at these little lies in the dioramas. So that's why I came up with Instagram because Indonesia is too big. That's just one easy, uh, easy way to to get uh, to it, and, and simply because there are several uh, Instagram celebrities in my head that have concerns towards the problematic history, which means it would be easy to connect to them. So it's it's uh, it's basically just juggling around whatever exists and what what I can work with, and there are other modes of communication that actually involves working with local radios that speaks the, the other, that their mother tongue is not Bahasa. None of us have Bahasa as mother tongue. So uh, in that sense, I would work with the radio with the translator. And there are also other cases in which I install banners on the street uh, in order to communicate. So it, it's really about being aware uh, to whom you are, you you want to speak to with the project that you're working with, I think. So, Instagram for people like us, sure. But there are other people that we can speak speak to. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, maybe just one quick, and if I can sort of like sneak in one final sort of like reflection, is to sort of like point to the relationship between an exhibition and a collection and its relationship to sort of like contemporary art, right? Uh, you are entering this research, I guess, through attending a workshop in a center for a contemporary art sort of like institute. And we have over the course of the conversation gave the impression that we sort of like, you know, come to a collection or an archive or subject in a true direct sort of like encounter. But often it's also through the works of others, other artists or artworks. That is uh, the outcome of a research of a past topic or, you know, our colleagues uh, who are curators or sort of like managers or artists. Uh, who works in the contemporary art world, uh, who expands, who, who has sort of like interest and then expands our horizon, right? There's only so much we can read. And at the same time, we're overwhelmed by so much information out there. And sometimes to filter down all that we are absorbing, I feel that having conversations uh, with colleagues are sort of like useful to ground our sort of like flights of imagination and locating what is meaningful and sort of like socially relevant. I mean. Yeah, my sense is contemporary art and its ecology is not just this funny, strange things that occupy space in a gallery and, and, and uh, with funny words that's used to sort of like describe them. It's sort of like actually a sort of like maybe you can think of it as a sort of like space that actually sort of encourages to sort of think quite interesting in, in quite interesting ways and allows us to sort of like see different sort of like things from the past that are uh, Previously, we would not even sort of like consider as important or meaningful to the way we sort of like view what is what what, what we get out of the, uh, what out of our engagement with art in general. Um, so I guess um, that's a way to sort of like say uh, it's not just looking at the past, but also at what's happening today. That's sort of like very uh, important to sort of like help shape uh, what are the pos what are the possible sort of like ways we can sort of like learn from um, archives and collections. Um, I'm, we're going to sort of like take a one hour break. The last time I sort of like announced this uh, and I, over I, I, I saw the idea that uh, there was tea and there wasn't tea, but today there is definitely lunch, right? <laughs> right uh, and then like half, half the room got mad at me. 
Uh, but today there is definitely lunch, am I right? Okay, so there is food. Uh, food will be sort of like served outside, uh, and it's, uh, our lunch break is for one hour, and we'll come back here at 2 p.m. 2 p.m. for the sort of like afternoon session where we'll have individual presentations. Thank you.